This is the story of Tommy and his childhood guilt. Like myself, Tommy had to endure early trauma that sent him on a downward spiral well into his adulthood. The narrative will be done by myself, Keith Erickson. Carrying the Guilt of My Childhood by Tommy T. The house was dark and quiet. The only noise was a constant hum that was coming from the swamp cooler encased in the frame of our bedroom window. I lay there awake in my bed as my brother Billy slept soundlessly in the bed atop of mine. Like many nights, I lay there with my thoughts running rampant about the dream my brother Billy and I had shared for as long as I can remember. World's greatest wrestling tag team had been all that we talked about for years. My brother Billy, who was older than me, was the one person in the world that I looked up to and knew that I could always count on. He was my hero, and I wanted nothing more than to be just like him. We used to talk about beating tag team wrestling sensations like the British Bulldogs, the Bushwhackers, and countless others that we had admired since we first started following wrestling together. While laying there in the darkness, I was startled by a noise that invaded our bedroom. The faint sound of a slow scraping began to pierce my ears, and I knew that it was something to fear. In all the years that Billy and I had shared our bedroom together, I had never once had any... This was our home, our safe haven, and the place where we should have never had to worry about anyone or anything coming into our lives with evil intention, but I was wrong. As I lay there watching the shadows reflection upon my wall, I knew that it was a stranger that had been making a scraping noise by removing the swamp cooler from my window frame. I lay there quiet, still, quiet as a mouse, and the man seemed to get bigger as his dark frame made its way into my bedroom. He stood there for what seemed like hours, just staring at my brother and I tucked away in our beds. I knew that this strange man was here to cause us harm, and yet, I could do nothing but lay there frightened and unable to scream for help. I was paralyzed with tremendous fear as Billy lay there obvious, oblivious to what was happening. Unable to move, I was forced to watch this strange man lurk across the bedroom floor and stretch his figure up to where my brother lay. Grabbing his ankle in what I realized later was an attempt at dragging my brother from where he sleep, the man yanked Billy from the top bunk with quite quick force. In that moment, I found my courage to scream matched with the screaming reaction of my brother who had just been startled from a deep sleep only to realize that danger had already invaded our bedroom. I watched my brother Billy kick and scream as a darkened figure attempted to pull him down from his bed and eventually the man gave up as he bolted back out the window from where he had come. My parents rushed into the bedroom as the man fled into the night and the rest of the night seemed to be just a blur. I remember laying there nestled in the arms of my mother as my father combed the property looking for any sign of this intruder. I sat there staring at my brother Billy and knew in that instant that our lives would never be the same. I never told Billy, but I remember looking at him as he held on to my mother for dear life and feeling as if I did not protect him. A strange man had entered our bedroom and I could do nothing but lay there in my own bed paralyzed with fear. I should have done something sooner, something more. Despite the fact that we moved out of the house shortly after, things were never the same again. My father, who was always quite the prankster, remained in the way that he was trying to make light of what had happened. I get it now. My father only wanted this to go away and not affect us the rest of our lives. It was too late. I felt like a coward and that I could have done more for Billy that night. If I learned anything, I adopted this ideology that what I had failed to do for Billy, which was protect him, was something that I would never be able to forgive myself for. I would like to say that Billy and I remained close after that night, but the truth is we grew further and further apart as we got older. We never talked about the stranger in our bedroom that night, but it was a guilt that loomed over me like a darkened cloud. No matter how hard I tried, it was a feeling that I had let the entire family down by cowering underneath my blankets. What kind of wrestling tag team partner lays there while his teammate is in danger? I just could not shake this guilt. Looking back on all of this after 30 plus years now, I can see how this incident influenced a lot of my behaviors growing up. For example, I remember walking through a store with my older cousins and being in the toy section. I picked up an action figure that I wanted but had no money to get it. I asked my older cousin Keith to buy it for me and told him, just put it in, po in your pocket, he said. I knew that it was wrong to steal, but when he, he said, don't be a coward, I felt embarrassed and angry. Something in my head clicked and I was not going to be a coward, not again. I put the action figure in my pocket and we all walked out of the store together. 
In my head, I felt like I had redeemed myself and proved that I was no longer a coward. The years following, I became a kid that would take any dare that was thrown at me by my peers. I wanted to prove to others that I was not the lonely and scared kid that I really was beneath the surface. So I wore the mask of deception that I think many kids at that age wear. Eventually, my actions began to have consequences that affected my family on a grander scale. I began to rebel against my mother and father, even though I knew they were doing the best that they could to raise me with good morals and principles. I failed them in that regard as well. At the age of 11, I started to experience bullying from other kids at school. His name was Ricardo, and he had become my nemesis. He would insult me in the hallways, chase me home after school to the park with his schoolyard cronies, and before long, I couldn't go anywhere without feeling like I was looking over my shoulder all the time. Eventually, he caught up to me and bloodied my nose. Once again, I felt like a coward because I did not even try to defend myself. I ran home with blood running down my battered face. I remember walking through the front door and seeing the look on my father's face. I told him that some kid had punched me in the face on the way home from school, and I could see the disappointment in his eyes as I stood there with tears running down my face. He grabbed me by the arm, took me into the garage, and told me he wanted to teach me how to defend myself. I never considered myself a fighter, but I did not want to let my father down any more than I feel that I did that day. So I followed him into the garage. Looking back to 30 years ago, I can now say that I was able to take full control of how I perceived things and how I reacted to him while I was hit in my early 20s. I went back to school the next day. I went back to school the next day and I could feel everyone looking at me. I walked through the hallways with a swollen lip and I remember feeling so uncomfortable and embarrassed. It wasn't for the first day back, but later that week, Ricardo, my bully nemesis, did corner me in an attempt to do what he always did. He pushed me, called me names, and took it a step further by spitting on me in front of everyone. So I did what my father had taught me that week in our garage. I balled up my fists and ran at him like there was no tomorrow. Minus the scrapes and cuts from the asphalt beneath us as we quarreled, I sustained no other injuries and it felt good. The next day, it was a lot like the other days. Everyone treated me differently. They moved out my way as I walked through the hallways and I could hear them whispering things about me, standing up to Ricardo that made me realize they no longer saw me as a kid that used to run away scared. It reminded me of the time I first stole something from the store with my older cousins, giving me praise. What I would learn later on in my life is that this was a negative reinforcement to what I thought was important, having the approval of what others thought of me. I began to change all around. My attitude towards my parents began to get worse. I rebelled at their every attempt to discipline me, started to get bad grades in school, and went against the family structure that we had at every opportunity I could. My mother was the one that took the reins in imposing discipline over me, and I resented her for it more and more. I developed a fear of my mother that grew more and more intense the older I got. It would take years, but eventually, I began to stand up to her just as well as I had Ricardo when he would bully me. Despite the fact that my mother was only trying to raise me with proper guidance and principles to live by, I continued to resist her in every way that I could. I myself began to turn into what Ricardo had been all of those years. I was insecure and wanted everyone else to feel what I had gone through growing up. Inside, I was ashamed of what I had become, and yet it became a means of my own survival and a way for me to conceal all of my insecurities from everyone around me. The more that I was able to intimidate others, the more I developed this idea that no one could take me. I was the toughest kid around, that I was going, what, what I was doing constantly trying to compensate for, the insecurities I had stemmed all the way back to, to when I felt I let my brother Billy down as a kid. It took my mother having to place me in a juvenile hall at the age of 12 for me to finally start thinking about my actions. Or so they thought this would be the best solution towards curbing my destruction and disrespectful behavior, but it only made my attitude that much more rebellious. I would spend the majority of my teens in and out of juvenile hall for various crimes, petty thefts, burglaries, car thefts, and various other crimes against the community. The county eventually removed me from the care of and supervision of my mother and sent me to my first placement home. That first placement home would be the first chain link in a long line of additional placement homes and boys' ranches I would run away from. Before long, my running days would end. The judge sentenced me to the California authority. 
I gravitated towards the gang subculture while at CYA. It had everything I felt would enhance my survival while I was there. Racism was something that was brand new to me and thought, though I'd grown up with a wide range of friends that had ethical backgrounds, I knew right away that I had to get in where I fit in. So I ran with the whites and did whatever was asked of me while I was in there. Unfortunately, I have always looked back on my time in youth glory as being a training facility for enhanced criminals. Kids were constantly figuring out ways to become better criminals than they were before they had come into the system. At the age of 19, after years in the California Youth Authority system, I caught life without the possibility of parole sentence with a younger kid that I started running around with in my neighborhood. Coming into the adult prison system was much like walking into California Youth Authority as a boy. However, it was a house of big boys now, and your actions would be life-threatening at a much higher cost. The gangs embraced me as I walked into the CDC. I was easily swayed by the political nonsense they had to offer and jumped right into formation with the rest of them. This was the old Tommy. It took me years to overcome the insecurities that I had stemming from my childhood, but when I finally did, I developed the courage to walk away from the gang ideology and everything that it stood for. I found strength in my faith, my family, and was able to then start standing on my own two feet, no longer caring what other people thought of me. It was not easy, turning back, turning your back on a prison gang in here is not something easily done without physical repercussions but I did it even when they attempted to take my life out on the yard. The past few years have been life changing for me and my family. California laws have changed where LWAP, life without the possibility of parole inmates are concerned. I am currently waiting on a court hearing that will determine my future within the next few months. I could very well be sitting on the other side of these chain link fences with my loved ones instead of spending the rest of my life in prison. I would like to share one last thing with those of you who will be reading my story, hearing my story on this podcast. Although I have lived with my life filled with countless afflictions, including the harm for which I have caused others in my community, there are also happy times that I've come to embrace and appreciate that much more now. Growing up, there were a lot of influences in my life that played a significant role in how my attitude and self-esteem were shaped, but that did not give me the right to further harm myself and others. If I could give a grain of advice that I would like to resonate with a child who is either faced with similar circumstances or is feeling like they are not good enough, it's this. Don't let anyone or anything make you feel as if you are not good enough. You are more unique than you realize. You will have challenges in life, but the best thing about this is that you will become stronger and stronger the more that you respond to them in a way that is positive. Thank you. Okay, that's it.